So the ESFJ or EFN, as CPT calls them as kind of a more cognitive type code, is actually quite a hard type to type into, perhaps one of the most difficult. Not because it's especially rare you understand, but just because if it is someone's true type, it's more likely they'll identify with or relate more to other types based upon typical type descriptions of this one. Most ESFJs I've known as either clients over here, or indeed in real life, have more commonly mistyped as INFP, INFJ, or ENFP than ESFJ. And I never miss an opportunity to remind people that the MBTI dichotomies that you receive from an online test have got very little to do with your underlying cognition. And it is the cognitive part of type which is most consistent. So this video is a pretty important one as it's going to be breaking down all of the misconceptions about this type and presenting five reasons to consider why you yourself might be one. But before we dive in, I do want to quickly clear something up. Even if the whole introvert versus extrovert thing is a more trait level and fluid characteristics, there is such thing as cognitive extroversion and cognitive introversion, and this is more consistent. The ESFJ is a cognitive extrovert and therefore has a primarily reactive rather than proactive cognition. This does not mean ESFJs are not sensitive, reflective, insightful, or any of the other stereotypes wrongly assigned to introversion across the board. But it does mean their cognition is more reactive, that is operating as an extension of an external medium, than proactive, entirely for its own sake. Reactive cognition does not mean a lack of introspection, but it does mean cognition that operates more in anticipation of or in conjunction with external interactivity. Sign number one that you might be an ESFJ, extroverted feeling, dominance. First, let's clear up the frankly huge misunderstanding about what extroverted feeling dominance actually means. The term dominant does not automatically translate to powerful and overt when dealing with cognitive functions. In fact, the extroverted feeling of this type in particular tends to be a lot less intense and a lot more subdued than the average ESTP or ENTP. Types who you would assume by contrast would have something a lot less dominant in its appearance. In fact, dominance here is not defined by the intensity of the function, but by the consistency of it. And this isn't even necessarily consistency of social output or interaction. FE dominance are not socializing 24 seven. In my experience, they can actually get a bit grumpy when socially oversaturated. The consistency of FE here pertains more to the valuing of it than it's consistent employment. This is why it's all too easy for such types to mistype as a type they consider to have a more secondary extroverted feeling, such as INFJ for example. They notice that they care about it quite a lot, but struggle to identify with the stereotypes that paint consistently pro-social pictures to unrealistic standards. Being an extrovert, you would consider an above average amount of overall external engagement, but just because the types are FE dominance, it does not automatically skew this external engagement more towards people than objects. Nonetheless, the activity of this type will tend to consistently revolve around an attunement to social harmony. More often than not, as we'll be getting to later in the video, FE dominance can often be spotted not by its overt display you know, of pro-social behavior, but by the way it informs and imbues all of the cognitive processes with a kind of pro-social utility. This is known as gateway theory within CPT. An FE dominance might build a successful business enterprise, for example, but they will often have done so from a more pro-societal or collectivistic core. An ENFJ CEO would seldom have built a business for an entirely self-serving reason. By contrast, it is more likely for an extroverted thinking dominant to engage in such business ventures for the sake of, I don't know, fun or personal challenge or for the personal awards that it offers at the end of the tunnel. FE dominance will still care about all of those things, but you'd seldom see these kind of awards completely isolated from some kind of social influence. Another implication of extroverted feeling dominance is in the attitude of this particular position. Here this cognitive element is convergent and therefore inherently more positivistic than negativistic. Ergo, the social motivations of this type are usually a force to enact positive social outcomes than avoid negative ones. 
Again, this does not mean the type will be hosting parties 24-7. I've actually found TE dominance to be a little bit better at that. But it does mean FE is consistently more within the ego and something that will be identified with. And it doesn't mean the type's going around giving everyone hugs and kisses either, by the way. And as it's within the ego, the type will, over the course of their lives, be more likely to develop adaptive social skill sets. And generally value highly the ability to engage with the social landscape. FE within the ego typically means a greater willingness to actively pursue and acquire social validation rather than simply expect it. Generally it means a cognition more oriented around communities, bonds, relationships, society than it would be otherwise. Especially when extroverted feeling is in dominant position. Because dominant position is ultimately a more expansive position, it means a position that can be changed and molded and adapted over time. Whereas extroverted feeling agency types like ENTPs and ESTPs might be more selective in their extroverted feeling and maybe a bit less societally oriented. Extroverted feeling dominance tend to be thinking, living and breathing humanity all the time. And as you might have guessed, all of this pro-social orientation tends to give the FE dominant a strong intellectual side that often goes unnoticed or simply unappreciated, especially ESFJs. Complementing the ESFJ's natural social adaptivity is a strong intellectual drive and curiosity that allows them to become great conversationalists all around. If you value social validation and will actively seek it without necessarily taking the level of social risks that an ESTP or ENTP might, ESFJ is strongly worth considering. If you see yourself as highly pro-social and valuing, even if you don't necessarily have the skill sets under your belt right yet, the ability to fluidly interact with a large variety of different people, ESFJ is again worth considering. Furthermore, if the side of you that values productivity and work ethic is highly imbued with a kind of social influence, be it more of a communal or societal one, ESFJ is again something you should be looking into. Sign number two that you might be an ESFJ. Extroverted feeling, extroverted intuition. What happens when these two are paired together? So here's the other thing, extroverted feeling when it's paired to extroverted intuition isn't really about intensity at all. In fact, the more intense and frankly vulnerable feeling of extroverted feeling when paired to extroverted sensing, such as in the case with the ENFJ, tends to feel a little bit uncomfortable for this type. Extroverted feeling when paired to extroverted intuition, F-E-N-E, -E, is much more about presenting a kind of self-protective veneer, a kind of one-size-fits-all persona, in order to essentially protect this type's more vulnerable side. They tend to be, on the whole, a little bit more self-preservative, let's say. In my experience, plenty of ESFJs value close and intimate bonds, but when it comes to actually sharing their own vulnerable side, they tend to lock up a bit more. And presenting a warm and loving exterior is often a means to avoid feeling out of control or at the mercy of other people. As with many extroverted feeling dominance, beneath the surface, this type can actually be pretty damn calculating. In CPT, extroverted intuition is understood as a broad scope directed externally. All of the various traits you might associate with extroverted intuition come as a result of that perceptual foundation. And when you pair extroverted intuition to any rational element, such as extroverted feeling here, the social energies tend to be diffused across a greater surface area. What does this mean in this case? Well, two things. Firstly, ESFJ's social energies tend to be directed more broadly and therefore oriented more to the general atmosphere or vibe than specific social micro nuance. And secondly, the diffusion effect of extroverted intuition tends to make this type's experience of the social atmosphere generally calm and more neutral. A good way to tell apart ENFJ from ESFJ then is not only in the intensity of gaze or lack thereof in the case of ESFJ, but in the comparative calmness oftentimes of an ESFJ's demeanor. Chill, cool, relaxed. These are often natural consequences of FENE. -E. That being said, if you scale up neuroticism in any given type, you'll typically see an absence of chill, relaxedness. But there's more. Any feeling energy paired to intuition tends to have a more naturally chameleonic side. And in the case of ESFJs, FENE, -E, the type is often adept at blending into a variety of different social settings. So if you yourself struggle to adapt to different social environments, ESFJ may actually be less likely, especially if you find social interactions in general kind of clunky 
been difficult, struggling to kind of get into the rhythm of them, for example. After all, this is one of the types best suited to icebreaking. Furthermore, extroverted intuition he was in agency position, acting as auxiliary to extroverted feeling. When any element is in agency position, it tends to become a bit more intense. Translated in this case, the extroverted intuition of this type tends to give the ESFJ a particularly strong love for new experiences, high openness, for example, um, exploration, travel, etc. And for many ESFJs, creative pursuits, especially if they are a little bit higher in introversion. Indeed, even more than ENFPs, many ESFJs can be running many different projects and creative pursuits in parallel so as to become something of a hurricane. And this often makes them masters of time management by necessity. And as a result, this actually tends to be one of the more naturally FOMO of the 16 types. And as extroverted intuition is on a more surface level, they'll often prefer to blitz through a hundred different books in a single year rather than intensely focus on a select few. If you tend to be an active explorer of humanity, getting to know different cultures, getting to know different people on a deep level, ESFJ is definitely worth considering. What's more, if your social interaction style is a little bit more easygoing, go with the flow, with you all the while going an extra mile to maintain important close bonds with the people in your life. Again, ESFJ is worth considering. Sound number three that you might be an ESFJ. Introverted feeling, introverted intuition. What goes on beneath the surface? You see, underneath the FENE mask is oftentimes a powerful sense of purpose and identity. Unlike NIFI in the case of the INTJ, for example, FI and I is much more about expanding upon one's own identity over time rather than selecting an archetype and running with it. This tends to give FI and I types like ESFJs and ISFPs a kind of natural sense of individuality that relies less upon choosing a path or archetype or profession to define who one is. And a consequence of this more naturally transformative and aspirational identity formation is in a tendency to borrow from one's future self. Both ISFBs and ESFJs can mistake the person they want to become for the person that they are now. And in doing so, maybe even overestimate their own nobility or sense of altruism, or indeed social grace in this case. As such, it is not in the least bit unusual for this type to present themselves to others as a kind of ideal, an extremely well-rounded person. And oftentimes they will be well-rounded, just not necessarily as much as they think they are, because it's all about pushing that FI and I transformation into the future. And another big implication of FI and I is mood. FM pairings, you know, pairing intuition to feeling, is much more about a mood sustained over time, and less attention is typically given to emotional micro fluctuations. And as such, there will tend to be certain emotional states that ESFJ is simply less experienced in handling. For example, FENE might be so fixated upon feelings of warmth and tranquility as to push down feelings of hostility and anger. Whereas an SF type like an ENFJ might freely visit these feelings as they come up in the moment, an NF type like an ESFJ can be so fixated upon maintaining a desired mood that they fail to get enough experience in order to deal with the more negative emotions. Ergo, when emotions like anger do arise, it can often be so explosive that the type can actually have a difficult time handling it. This might even ensue a kind of Jekyll and Hyde situation, where the type has so little experience handling certain moves that they end up saying things that they might regret in the moment. And as with FI and I, once the mood has passed, it may be as if it never happened in the first place. But on a lighter note, introverted feeling, introverted intuition, convergence, you know, the ISFP side, of the ESFJ, pushes the individual to become the best version of themselves that they possibly can be. There is a huge evolutionary drive to the ESFJ that often goes overlooked, yet it's one of the sole reasons why this type tends to, more than any other, live each day as if it might be their last. And making the most of every moment and seizing the day, so to speak, is complemented by the introverted sensing authority of this type. If you feel a deep sense of intrinsic identity and are constantly pushing yourself forward to become the best version of yourself, ESFJ should be considered. Especially if this occurs under the surface, unbeknownst to the people around you, seldom, seldom intruding upon social harmony. Sign up before that you might be an ESFJ, the introverted sensing authority.
So while this type on the surface can be all extroverted intuition, exploration, easygoingness, openness to new experiences, beneath the surface is a strong introverted sensing bedrock. Now, the introverted sensing authority does not automatically equate to memories or routines. These are just stereotypes and two of the myriad possible ways it can manifest within any individual. Imagine introverted sensing instead as the earth beneath an ESFJ's feet to enable them to engage in the freeform exploration they might prefer. As such, knowing an ESFJ can be like knowing someone who is highly freeform in some ways, yet highly rigid in others. And more than any other type, this is someone who tends to crave consistency for their own mental well-being. And this need for consistency can show up in different ways. Yeah, okay, some ESFJs might fit into the stereotype of being more traditional or routine-based or creating lots of different memories that they can relive in their heads or share with loved ones. But one consistent way that's going to be true for many more ESFJs is the maintenance of lifelong friendships. This type tends to dedicate a huge amount of cognitive load to keeping up with the people in their lives and maintaining their kind of F-E-N-E -E social web. And these will often not be superficial relationships either. Often this is a type that builds strong relationships and loves meaningful one-on-one -on -one encounters. And they will seldom forget a friend even when years have passed. And of course there can be other sources of consistency to satiate the SI authority of this type. Some ESFJs are extremely routine oriented, perhaps prioritizing their all important TV time at the end of a working day. Some ESFJs might rely instead upon projects and hobbies. Do not underestimate the potential of creative pursuits to provide someone with a sense of consistency. Many ESFJs I know who happen to play a musical instrument might not be masters of the craft, but have actually sustained their skill set over time, whereas other people may have dropped them after two or three years. All of us require consistency as human beings, but if you find yourself being particularly dysregulated when consistency is taken away from you, ESFJ might be worth considering. More extroverted variants of this type will tend to have a hyperactive extroverted intuition, trying to fill their calendar with as many things as possible. This in turn creates a bedrock of meaningful experiences that act as a kind of token of a life well lived. However, let's be honest, there don't seem to be many super extroverted ESFJs in this community. Indeed, many of the ESFJs watching this video, you know, the people who are actually ESFJs, whether they know it or not, will often be introverted subtypes. And when the extroverted intuition of this type is scaled back in such a more introverted subtype, the type will often focus more upon their introverted thinking, introverted sensing, in order to give them their stability, rather than experiences alone. So if you find yourself becoming anxious and unsettled when consistency is taken away from you, ensuring to keep up with your creative projects or social connections and relationships, ESFJ should be considered in your typing journey. And if you find yourself in a kind of duality, where on the one hand you are very bubbly and creative and open-minded, yet on the other one you have a very high executive function and tend to be strict in your routines, habits, or expectations of other people, again, this type is well worth a look. Sign number five that you might be an ESFJ, the extroverted thinking, extroverted sensing pairing that acts as an extension of this type's cognition. So another thing that gets misunderstood about this type is their ability to set goals and actively work towards the goal's completion. Beneath the FENE veneer, this type often has a well-developed ENTJ dip. Just as FINI propels a strong sense of ambition and individuality, it is TESE on the other side of the axis that kind of acts out these energies in the real world. TESE is less about experiences and much more about acquiring what one desires from the world around you. That being said, it is still softened by the introverted sensing authority of this type to which TESE is still subordinate. Therefore, the ambitions of this type will not necessarily be super lofty, as they will often be more grounded in a sense of consistency, you know, seeking a family, a well-paying job, a sense of security. And the ISFP side can often create enough individuality within. So maximizing their own individual impact on the world around them will still not tend to be as strong as an actual ENTJ. That being said, when this type knows what they want, they tend to be exceptionally good at acquiring it. Be it a high grade from an exam, a promotion, or a creative opportunity, this type can actually be a lot more calculating than they might let on. You see, the consistency of introverted sensing in this type is often channeled into TESE. If they say they're going to build a piece of furniture, they'll do it. If they say they're going to learn a musical instrument, they will do it. If they say they'll complete a series of books, again, they will do it. This is a type that both does exactly what they say they will do, all the while 
having enough understanding of their own limitations so as not to place too much expectations upon the TESE result. And even among the more introverted ESFJs in the type community, you know, all those people mistyping as INFJ, INFP, etc. ENTJ sides will still be there. Many of the more subdued ESFJs I end up typing are still people who tend to do exactly what they say they're going to do. Even the softer, more introverted variants of this type still have a strong sense of will and capacity to do what they set out to do. Executive function is a pretty broad term and many ESFJs I know do have ADHD, but in spite of that they still tend to have that kind of ENTJ streak that allows them to manage their time effectively and achieve what they set out to achieve. And if you find that kind of balanced with a more exploratory, open-minded side, ESFJ should be considered. But a lot of what we've discussed so far in this video is all kind of subordinate to the diversion pairing of this type, the introverted thinking, introverted sensing that opposes the dominant pairing. This is a type that oftentimes, more than anything, knows the correct way to do something. Whereas the correctness of an ENFJ tends to be more societal and high level, ethical, for example, the correctness of an ESFJ tends to be more procedural. And this very proceduralism can make this type very set in their ways and exacting on the one hand, but highly reliable on the other. I often joke with clients that if I was ever going to choose a particular type to go into space as an astronaut, it would be the ESFJ. Introverted thinking, introverted sensing divergence screams reliability. They often know what they're doing and exactly why they are doing it. And even more than that, the correct way of doing something and the reasons behind it can be wonderfully and fluidly communicated by the much more adaptive extroverted feeling, extroverted intuition of this type. This makes this type not only a gifted specialist, but also a gifted teacher. More than anything, this type wants to get it right. As opposed to ENFJs who can be a lot more sweeping in their equivalences, or INFJs who can be a lot more sweeping in their generalizations and notoriously hard to change the mind of. ESFJs tend to be very uncomfortable committing to anything that they themselves have not analysed in great detail. In a debate, therefore, this is a type who is both open-minded, yet sceptical. And they are often so open-minded in wonderful conversational partners just because they have not yet committed to a firm idea. That being said, the conclusions they have come to, especially when it concerns more the procedure or the way things should be, this is going to be more of a stubborn type. And as good as a conversational partner they might be, if someone is talking gibberish, or what someone's saying simply doesn't add up, doesn't seem to be consistent, this type may, at best, give little concern internally for what the person's saying, and at worst, totally ignore the person henceforth. And in such a case, this type, while remaining very pleasant and sociable on the outside, may have very little concern for someone who doesn't seem to be coherent in their logic. The actionable, analytical streak of this type tends to be a trait that goes highly unnoticed. Yet, it is exactly for this reason that this type tends to, more than any other type, even know what they are talking about. So if you find your logical style more cautious, not wanting to commit to anything too fast, all the while strong and robust beneath the surface, this type should be considered. Oftentimes the ESFJ is open-minded on the surface, yet internally suffer very few fools. If the logic doesn't add up, or there seems to be something missing, this is going to be a hard type to sway. And this makes for a type who is often very difficult to manipulate and seldom gullible. Bonus point number two, introverted sensing, introverted feeling, rather than introverted feeling, introverted sensing. And I'll explain what I mean by this in a moment. And this last point employs CPT network theory, which you can find more about over here. In a nutshell, network theory expands upon how we can access different types of cognitions, different cognitive networks, and it follows that some of these functions, some of these types, will be more accessible than other ones. It doesn't just stop at that kind of four sides of the mind thing and then everything's free game. And all of this is simply an extension of, say, the ENTJ side of the ESFJ, using more moving parts but keeping to a similar formula. And one of the biggest tells of, say, ESFJ versus ENFJ is in the auxiliary networks of these types. Within a dominant network, an ENFJ has a strong INFP side, therefore introverted feeling in dominance and introverted sensing backing it up, FISI. By contrast, however, an ESFJ's auxiliary networks include a strong ISTJ side, which features SI in dominant position and FI backing that up. And this is where the more stubborn part of this type comes from. Whereas FISI is much more naturally adaptive, opening that big expansive FI in order to accommodate the chaos of the external world. 
harmonizing, if you will. SIFI tends to double down on one's own sense of values and stand like a rock in the face of adversity. So while on the surface this type can appear pretty go with the flow and adaptable, beneath the surface this is a type who can be seldom pushed around or told what to do. SIFI is all about locking in one's own boundaries and comfort zone, and in essence the opposite of what FISI is. When FI is in dominant position, it's a place of great change and turbulence, such as the FINI, transformation of the ESFJ. But when FI is locked into agency position, such as SIFI, the ISTJ streak of this type, it is much more about regulation. And it is the ISTJ auxiliary network of this type that gives them the kind of determination and grit that allows their ENTJ side to be maximally employed. It is the ISTJ auxiliary network that instills in the ESFJ the natural sense of discipline and very much enables their ENTJ-ish streak. All of these things, as you may notice, connect to each other. If a type is one way, it's often because there's an auxiliary network or even tertiary network backing that primary network up. Everything here is connected, which I find quite beautiful. However, it is also the ISTJ network operating underneath FENE that gives this type a strong sense of anxiety when things seem out of their control. And it's also why some ESFJs you know might be especially rigid individuals. I like to liken SIFI to the dwarves in The Lord of the Rings. So if you can stand like a rock for your own values, not for entirely your own sake or self-preservation, but for the good of social harmony and society even at large, ESFJ is again a very good type to consider in your typing journey. Granted, ESFJs tend not to be particularly disagreeable and will often spend more time blending in than going against the grain. However, despite this, internally they tend to hold to their own values and sense of personal identity. So that concludes the video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this has been informative and shed some light on a highly misunderstood and frankly underrated cognitive type. And we're almost done with the five science series as well, so soon I'll have some more space to play around with some other video content ideas too. As many of you may know, CPT isn't all about just putting people into typological categories. The typological side of CPT is actually more just a natural consequence of its cognitive preoccupation. Individual differences exist more on just the trait level. I'm actually quite excited about the direction science is progressing in order to accommodate individual differences on multiple levels rather than just a select few. If you know anyone who you think might be an ESFJ, be sure to share this video with them, and I hope I maybe open some people's minds to the prospect of they themselves being ESFJs. If you'd like to support CPT on an additional level, I highly recommend checking out the CPT Patreon, and if you are still uncertain about what your type might be, I do supply typing services on the website, and I also supply coaching services for people interested in individuation or employing their cognitive functions to achieve real-world results. But that's it for me, and I'll be back in about a month. For now, take care.